Ah, freedom of speech, one of the building blocks of the American way of life. The freedom to say whatever you want, no matter how flocking and down with the mother flocking and... The freedom to say whatever you want, no matter how flocking with... Come on. Hate speech. That term's so hot right now. Do I blame Donald Trump for uh, using hate speech during his campaign? Absolutely. He did. It's a fact. Normalization of hate speech. Of hate speech. Hate speech. Hate speech! Hate speech and freedom of speech, two different things. I don't defend hate speech. Hate speech. Hate speech is for about to song. Seems everyone's talking about it, but here's the thing. Okay, hate speech doesn't actually exist. I don't believe you. Now, banning hate speech would sound nice on its surface. Nobody really wants to be hateful or deliberately speak in a way that would hatefully hurt somebody's feelings. Most people don't. But if you buy into the concept of hate speech, some questions arise, like who gets to decide? What is and isn't hate speech? How much of hate speech is protected under the First Amendment, if any at all? What limitations should there be on speech? Who are the arbiters of this limitation on speech? And where does the idea of hate speech, let's start with this, or political correctness actually come from? Why does it exist? Some will argue against this, but political correctness stems from something called the Frankfurt School. And when you hear someone refer to the Frankfurt School, they're actually talking about a group of scholars who were associated with the Institute for Social Research, founded in Frankfurt in 1923. When you hear the term cultural Marxism, this is where it comes from. Political correctness and cultural Marxism are one and the same. But let me read for you something that I think uh, perfectly crystallizes this from uh, Trent Schroyer's Critique of Domination, Part 227. As advanced industrial societies developed, the individual was more integrated into and dependent upon the collectivity and less able to utilize society for active self-expression. So it's important to understand that the idea of political correctness from its inception was designed as a political weapon to silence voices of dissent, which is why the new left in the 1970s often used it and adopted it themselves. And that's why what's politically correct is ever changing. Is it colored people or people of color? I don't know what. Is it gay, queer, or f it? No one knows. And this is why political correctness or cultural Marxism, and they are synonymous, lends itself so fashionably to easy labels. Transphobic, homophobic, xenophobic, racist, bigoted, Uncle Tom, white privilege, mansplaining, all of these are slapped on people with politically incorrect opinions in an attempt to silence you. Was there a reverb on my mic? No, that's MTV's Decoded. Oh, no, that makes sense. So what does this mean more importantly than making society less fun and comedy suck ball or vagina or anything yet to be defined? It creates an inability to criticize Bad ideas, bad ideologies, like Islam, for example, or the current illegal immigration problem, or the welfare state. So hate speech is inextricably tied to political correctness or cultural Marxism, and that creates intellectual conformity or intellectual authoritarianism. And that's where you start to see things like safe spaces or trigger warnings or speakers banned from campus or people with unpopular opinions banned from social media. And I know that can seem trivial, but today's social media outrage can be tomorrow's laws. And as we've seen, hate speech laws and political correctness destroys lives, as we see all across Europe. For example, these British men are arrested for offensive anti-Islam comments. These people arrested for saying racist things on a tram. Or our very own friend Tommy Robinson, who is charged with inciting racial hatred uh, with a flag that says, F ISIS. Shouldn't other Muslims want to F ISIS? Or this singer arrested for racism after doing a cover of Kung Fu fighting at the wrong time because a Chinese passerby happened to hear him outside the bar. Mr. Go right three. <laughs> And if that's not enough, just read this list of 16 people who are banned from the UK. Now that's not supposed to happen stateside, but it's often hard to defend freedom of speech because you're often forced to defend people who say horrible things, as you see with high profile cases here and here and here. Now I think what they're saying is terrible, but unless they're causing direct harm, of course their speech is protected in the United States. And our founders expressly made that so. My favorite here is from Benjamin Franklin. If all printers were determined not to print anything till they were sure it would offend nobody, there would be very little printed. So what's the end game here with hate speech laws? Well, a couple of things. On that front, we have legal censorship from the government. 
And that's a problem, but it's not nearly as pervasive as the one we face daily from cultural Marxism in the intimidation, the cultural authoritarianism of intimidating people into self-censorship. Sure, the government may not step in and tell you that you can't say something, but for fear of losing your job, for fear of being ostracized in society, for fear of being exiled as a racist, as a transphobe, or labeled with one of these life-altering names, People are intimidated into silence. At that point, the government's not required, which is the brilliant sleight of hand that you see uh, from the modern left, as seen here by the ACLU, where they will defend legally one's right to freedom of speech, but they will hesitate at nothing to destroy someone's life culturally for saying the wrong thing. I know a lot of people don't like to acknowledge the spectrum of left versus right, but at a certain point, you do have to look at this. You do have to look at the First Amendment and say, okay, who am I linking arms with? I get it, political platforms change, but today, which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban speech? Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to create a new acronym for fear of you losing your job? Which side of the political spectrum is always trying to ban people from campus, from universities, from media, from television? Which side of the political spectrum is always demanding safe spaces or trigger warnings or creating post-presidential election counseling because Donald Trump won? <laughs> On the contrast, think of your professors, think of websites, think of here on YouTube. Which channels, which outlets, which people on which side of the political spectrum are always demanding more open conversation, are always saying we believe a platform of more voices, not less, are always wanting to have an exchange of open ideas, are always wanting people to have the right to speak freely even if we disagree with them. Naturally, it's the political right, which is ironic because if you want progress in society, well, the most progressive thing you can possibly do is allow an open exchange of ideas and let the cards fall where they may. If you've learned nothing else today, don't be fooled into allowing people to separate hate speech and free speech. There is no difference. There is no delineation. And as far as you're right, as far as the First Amendment, does it protect hate speech? Not only does it protect it, but that's exactly why it exists. If you like this video, subscribe. How? by clicking the letters that say subscribe. If you want to read the references or learn more, click my face to go to my website, or you can watch one of these videos playing in boxes next to me. It's the magic of the, those are boxes that are playing. We used to call them talkies.